Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you can type in the chat box or unmute yourself if you have anything along the way. So I'm just going to start talking about my experience um, from when I was a youth exchange student in 2013 um, until now. Uh, yeah, so my hair no longer looks like that. If there's one regret I have from my exchange is having that hairstyle. So just don't hold that against me. We all make mistakes when we're teenagers, I guess. Um, so I uh, was a youth exchange student in Peru. Uh, I had uh, three different host families. Uh, one of them was in Iquitos, um, and the other two, I spent the majority of my time in Lima, uh, the capital city, um, both of which were really wonderful experiences. Uh, Iquitos, the family that I lived with, I only lived um, with them for a shorter period of time, just for the summer. Um, and in the, the summer in Peru is uh, January, February, and part of March. Um, so it's the reverse for us in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, that was a really interesting city to live in. Um, the, the host father I had was a locally famous Rotarian. Um, Iquitos was such a unique city. I still believe this is true today. It's the only metropolitan area in the world that you cannot access with a car. You can only take a boat or fly there. Um, and there, were, there weren't many foreigners there. There were some tourists, but they mostly stayed in resorts. Um, and when I was there, I had two host sisters. Um, and at that point in my exchange year, my Spanish improved so, so, so much. Um, <laughs> so I have to thank my host family in Iquitos for that because in Lima there were still lots of foreigners. Um, yeah, it's just overall just a really unforgettable experience and it really, really, I think shaped who I was um, in such like a formative time in my life being a 17 year old, 18 year old. Um, and I'm so, so, so grateful for that. I got to travel around Peru quite a bit. Um, and um, I think about it a lot, and I still have lots of friends. Um, three days ago, I, I, I talked with my one of my host families um, that I had there, and uh, this past fall, a friend, another exchange student I made um, there was is from Germany. She came to visit me a couple of times in the fall, in October and November, because she had an internship in the US, um, which was a really great experience to see her again, her dad told her that he was so amazed that she had kept in, that we've kept in contact. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, this is me back in 2013, my host family welcoming me at the airport. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I chose to go to Peru because I, at the time, I didn't know anybody who had gone to South America before. I think I had met one woman who went to Colombia, and I had a close friend of mine who was Colombian at the time. Um, and I, it just seemed like a really unique place. Um, I think when I was applying to participate in the program, at the time, I could select five countries that I wanted to go to, and so I chose all five of my countries in Latin America, um, and they interviewed me. I didn't include Brazil, and they asked me in the interview, they were like, why didn't, why didn't you want to go to Brazil? And I said, because I had a cousin who did an AFS program in Brazil, and I wanted to do something different, like something like no one in my family had ever been to, um, to uh Latin America or Spanish speaking country and I wanted to experience something different. Um, and he, he liked the answer. Uh, I went, I went after I graduated high school um, and I never, I never thought about it as a gap year until um, I think I was in a class my senior year of high school. We all went around and people said what they were doing after they were graduating. Some people were working. A number of people were going to college and I said I was going to Peru and everyone was like what the heck um, and a teacher was, uh, the teacher said oh that's such a great idea to take a gap year and I had no idea what a gap year was I never I just I wanted to do something um, I just wanted to do something I wanted to like travel and I wanted to learn another language and visit a place I'd never been before um, 
and so uh, when I was a senior in high school, I was looking for opportunities um, to go to another country. And a friend of my mom's um, told me about the about Rotary. I'd never heard about it before. Um, and I started going to Rotary meetings with my mother um, and uh, just got involved in the club and they accepted me into the program. Um, and my parents are very uh, supportive of me. They never were afraid for me to go. My mom was like, this is such a great opportunity. And I'm so grateful to them. Um, they were just such, um, I couldn't have asked for anything more from my from my mother. She was really, really emotionally supportive. Um, she is such a fearless warrior. I'll, I'll talk about her later uh, in another slide. Um, I also wanted I wanted to do something a little bit less traditional because I was I was a I was a pretty good student in high school. I think I got I was probably like a B student in high school. I got a fair amount of C's, but I excelled in. Um, I excelled in sports and theater. Those are more of my outlets. And going to college, I just, I didn't, um, I didn't know if that was right for me. I didn't know if I would sell academically. And so I wanted to do something like to grow myself a little bit. Um, and I, yeah, couldn't have asked, asked for a better experience. Um, yeah, so those are some of my friends uh, that I made in Peru. My mother, she came to visit me um, in Peru. Uh, we, we saw Machu Picchu. We hiked the Incan Trail together. It was really, 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 really cool. Um, uh, yeah, I would say the end of high school was a little difficult for me. Um, a lot of people were going to college. A lot of my friends were leaving. Uh, five weeks before I graduated college, my brother died by suicide and it was such a it was such such a difficult experience it was such a horrible experience to go through um it was really traumatic and at the time i didn't fully understand it and i just i really wanted to i had been accepted to to um the youth exchange program at the time and i really was looking forward to doing something on my own and kind of getting away from the trauma of that. And even during my time in Peru, I was just like, even the bad things that happened when I was there, I had one host family who that wasn't a great fit. Um, you know, when you're, many of you have studied abroad, um, you feel awkward, you look different from other people, you have an accent, you can't really speak the language. It's, you know, there's some negative experiences that really, really can feel uncomfortable sometimes. But even the bad things I experienced, I was like, this is so great still because I'm alive because I was, I was leaving of being so close to death and having my brother go through this horrible thing and having died. Um, so I was just so grateful. Every single thing that happened during that year, I was like, this is the best. I love Peru. Like I'm experiencing all these things. Um, it's challenging and I love it. So that was kind of the mindset that I went in with um, during my year. Um, I, just, I just really wanted to do something and experience it all. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm so grateful to my mother too. She was really, really supportive um, during that time. And then um, uh, towards the end of my year in, in Peru, um, for the first time, I was like, I really, really, really want to study. I just I experienced all of these things and I want to just keep learning and keep studying. Um, I really felt really, really motivated to go to college, which you know, the year before that, I had no desire to do that. Um, and uh, actually, during my time in Peru, I wrote an essay about my experiences there, which got me a scholarship um, to go to uh, Beloit College, which is a small liberal arts school in Wisconsin, um, about, mm, I'd say, 45 minutes an hour south of Madison and 90 minutes um, west of Chicago. Um, and I, um, yeah, I went there and I, I excelled academically. I 
graduated magna cum laude. Um, I was the only one with my degree to graduate with departmental honors. I, would, I spent so much time in the library, um, Saturday nights, all day Sunday. Um, and so I think if anybody knows students who are thinking about doing the youth exchange program who mm, you know, had kind of low self-esteem in high school or had struggled with their identity, I think during my exchange, I matured a lot. I matured a lot and I became a lot more motivated. Um, I you know, came together with my identity, um, felt more comfortable with myself, gained a lot of confidence, and that really showed in college. I don't think I would have done well in college um, if I had just gone because I felt like I had obligated to. Um, I really was really motivated because I think of my year in Peru. Um, and I, I took, I tried to take as many opportunities as I could in college. Um, I got a grant to uh, work at a migrant shelter um, with um, South American migrants. Um, and I spoke Spanish and they needed, you know, Spanish speaking volunteers there. Um, I volunteered for everything in college. I, I volunteered at a literacy council, um, tutoring ESL. Um, and I got an internship there as a citizenship instructor where I taught students skills, language skills they needed to pass the US citizenship exam and work and file all the paperwork. Um, I basically said yes to everything during college. Um, I even got an internship at the Embassy of Honduras. Um, at the time, I was maybe interested in working with the State Department. Um, it was just, uh, I said yes to everything. I declared my major right away. My major is international relations, which other Rotex say that's totally the stereotypical Rotary youth exchange uh, choices study. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it so, so, so much. Um, it was, I really enjoyed what I studied. Um, and I tried to do as many hands-on opportunities as I could. And even now I'm like, I wish I could have done even more um, hands-on things. Um, and um, I graduated uh, in 2018. Um, and after I graduated, I, uh, I um, worked at a nonprofit in Mexico, uh, in Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, I had an ESL teaching certification. Um, and so I, I, I taught part time in, in primary schools. And then I also at the nonprofit, I, I did more administrative work. Um, it was a nonprofit dedicated to promoting educational and environmental uh, education programs in the primary schools. Um, and so we did field trips to local turtle sanctuaries and beach cleanups. Um, we took kids to, it was a very rural area, and we took kids to like field trips to the cinema and things like that, kind of getting them outside of their local communities and exploring the region a little bit more. And it was really, it was great. Um, but I left that job to come back to the Twin Cities where I started working as a bilingual legal assistant at an immigration law firm. Um, and most of the clients were uh, Spanish speaking. Um, and that, that was a really great work experience. I got to see, I had done a, a lot of immigration work during my time at, at school, but um, it, was, uh, I, it was interesting to see the, the more legal side of things and work on the, the opposite side of that. But I, I ended up leaving that job. I left the law firm in December. Um, it feels not that far away, because it's not, um, to pursue a Fulbright scholarship, which I received. And that started in January. Um, and I was teaching uh, at a high school there in partnership with the US Embassy and the Ministry of Education. Um, and I was there so briefly uh, until the end of March when the Fulbright program was suspended worldwide and all the Fulbright participants were sent back. So I came back to the um, United States um, and I'm currently in South Minneapolis once again. Um, so yeah, this is a, it's a very blurry photo of me. When I was in Chicago just after I graduated um, and uh, Currently, um, like I said, I'm in South Minneapolis, but I'm moving to Chicago. Um, I'm moving with a girlfriend on uh, in 10 days, actually, May 16th, and um, I'm searching for job opportunities there. Um, so, I mean, if anybody has uh, any tips, uh, 
for future career paths or if anybody knows um, any students who are interested in participating in the youth exchange program they can contact me on I'm on LinkedIn. I'll type it in the chat box. I'm on LinkedIn. They can message me on Instagram or add me Facebook, email me. Um, I'm very passionate about youth exchange. I think a dream of mine would be to start my own like youth exchange program or company or something and really promote this for students because it, it really changed my life. It really, really did. Um, and I think it can, it has the ability to really positively affect um, communities that people live in in the U.S. and basically the whole world. Not to sound dramatic, but I really believe in it. So, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, ask me anything. I'm, a, I'm totally an open book. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Laura about her exchange or about her uh, future uh, job prospects or previous job prospects or what it was like in um, being evacuated back to the United States. We've kind of talked a little bit about that for the last uh, several um, students who had experienced the same thing. And so that's, you know, was tough for them. I imagine it was tough for you to, to get yanked out of that, um, out of those opportunities. So if anybody has a question, Greg, it looks like you had a question. Laura, any chance that Fulbright will send you back to Malaysia a year from now? Um, well, there there is some talk in the Fulbright Association that um, they that students who were evacuated early can renew their grants or just have non-competitive eligibility and participate in the program again. But it wouldn't be until January of 2021, um, and that's about eight months away. And I there's no guarantee um, that that will happen, and so I don't want to get my hopes up quite yet. Um, and I'm also, I'm not sure what I'll do between now and then. Um, there's just so much uncertainty and I, I don't want to count on it right now. But I know that I will go back to visit one day. It might not be under the auspices of uh, Fulbright, but I will definitely go back to visit one day because I, I made a lot of friends in the short time that I was there and I was deeply involved with the community. Um, and I would love to explore that region uh, much more heavily because Malaysia is such a diverse and incredible country. Um, so I will go back sometime, but it, it may or may not be under Fulbright. I have a question, Laura. I'd like to know a little bit more about the Fulbright Break program, um, what the application process was like, what they were looking for in candidates, and um, you know how you were placed in Malaysia. Yeah. So the Fulbright program, um, unlike with Rotary, where Rotary chooses the country for you, when I got my actually acceptance letter for Rotary, I, I said I really wanted to go to Colombia and I filled in basically every other country in um, South America and I opened the letter and I was like, oh my God, Peru. I don't even think I could have placed Peru on a map at the time, um, but I'm really glad I went, of course. I fell in love with the country. But with Fulbright, you apply directly to the country. Um, there are a couple of different Fulbright programs. Um, there's the research program, which um, gives grant money, scholarship money to, it's mostly graduate students or PhD students researching a really, really specific subject um, in a specific country um, who need money to conduct the research in that country um, and for travel and living costs. Um, there's also the English teaching program, which is what I did, which takes um, um, English teachers, um, people who have had teaching experiences in the United States to go um, help English teachers um, in other countries like Malaysia to help strengthen um, the English programs. And Malaysia is a country that um, they have a really uh, high standard of education, um, but one thing that the Ministry of Education said that they that students struggled with was confidence in speaking um, and so we were put in, in rural areas that aren't exposed to many outsiders because actually in the capital city of Malaysia Kuala Lumpur there are a lot of English speakers it's kind of like the main language but in other parts of Malaysia there's they're more um, homogenous and they don't speak 
English as much. And so people can read it and write it, but don't feel confident in their pronunciation. So foreign English teachers were there at schools to help um, develop a more, uh, like a more diverse curriculum rather than having a test-based curriculum. We were encouraged to think of more creative ways to get students to speak and practice English through dance, um, songs, workshops, making speeches. Um, so yeah, um, so that was what I participated in. And I think now there's, uh, Fulbright has, has partnered with National Geographic to, to give scholarships and grants to another program. It's, I think it's more photography and videography related, but um, I would have to look into what that is exactly. But for the English teaching program, I had to, um, it's a lot like um, lots of applications for grad school, for example. I had to submit my transcripts. Um, I had there are three letters of recommendation. Um, it's good if you have um, like maybe one or two professors um, and then maybe a supervisor at an internship or somewhere you volunteered, write the letter of recommendation. Um, and then you write two different essays. One is a, is a personal statement about who you are as a person, um, you know, talking about your identity and where you come from and what you like for yourself in the future. Um, that kind of an essay, just one page. So you have to fit your entire life in just one page. I spent maybe five months working on these two essays. It was a lot. <laughs> um, and then I, um, and then I wrote a, a statement of grant purpose was, which was why I chose Malaysia, which is why I um, decided to um, teach ESL, which is why I was interested in teaching and education. Um, and I chose Malaysia because um, I, I had a lot of experience in college working with uh, immigrant populations. They were mostly Hispanic populations, but um, uh, I worked with a lot of Arab populations too. And um, I was interested in learning more about Islam, which is the main religion in Malaysia. And I also wanted to strengthen my knowledge of that region of the world because I had never been there before. Um, and I was really drawn to the diversity of the country. Um, there are, it's incredibly diverse. There's Malay, it's like the United States really. It's, there's Malay populations, Chinese populations, Indian populations. They all have their different foods and their languages. And I was very curious to see how um, a country so, so diverse um, can be so, um, productive and peaceful um, and forward thinking. Um, and I was, I was really interested in learning more about it. Um, so that's why I chose Malaysia. Yeah, if anyone has a college, knows college students who are thinking of applying, they should definitely, um, definitely do it. I mean, even if you don't get the scholarship, just the application process is so rigorous, you really become a much, a much better writer, I would say. Laura, I have a question about Malaysia because I know nothing about the country. <laughs> yeah. What's it like to live there as a female? Is, um, just, can you tell us just about that culture a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's such, uh, well, Malaysia, uh, gosh, I wish I had a, a map to show you guys, but it's a, it's a country in Southeast Asia. There's actually two parts of the country. There's Peninsular Malaysia, um, and then there is uh, Borneo, which is a, uh, part of Malaysia that's on the island of Borneo, um, which shares a border with Indonesia. Um, Malaysia, it's uh, predominantly uh, Muslim, but there are, um, there's a large uh, Hindi population, Christian population. It's very, very diverse. Um, the majority of the population is Malaysian Malay. Um, the, the, the ethnicity is Malay, but there's also a lot of uh, Chinese people, um, people of South Indian descent, um, mostly Tamil. There's a large indigenous population, which they call Orang Asli, who mostly live in uh, Borneo, but also um, live in the center of peninsular Malaysia. Um, there are huge metropolitan areas in Malaysia, like Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur is like, um, a really, really modern, clean city, kind of like, you know, 
like Singapore almost, or a, another large city in Asia, like you can imagine, a very modern transit system. Um, there's Penang as well, which is kind of a, the food capital. Anthony Bourdain did an episode there, um, also another large metropolitan area. But then you go to rural Malaysia and it's really different. Like it's almost like a different country basically. Um, and I was in a state called Terengganu, which was like 98 or 99% Malay um, and 98 or 99% um, Muslim. Um, it was uh, it was a really fascinating experience. Um, uh, people were incredibly, incredibly kind. It was so easy to make friends. I would even say easier than in other places I've lived in. I mean, people were just so curious to talk with a foreigner. Um, you know, you don't often see many foreigners in Terengganu. Um, um, people would always, you know, want to sit down and have dinner um, and were just curious about the United States. It's like, um, I think lots of Americans think that everyone knows like where the United States is and what the United States is. But I got questions like, what's the difference between the United States and the United Kingdom? I mean, people didn't, it's so far. It's the opposite side of the world. I mean, the same way that lots of Americans probably can't put Malaysia on a place Malaysia on a map. I think lots of Malaysians probably can't place maybe the US on a map. I mean, um, it was just so different. Um, it was really beautiful. I mean, the time that I had there, I just loved every minute of it. People were so nice. My students were really, really smart and very curious. Um, it's incredibly peaceful. Um, there were people got along so well. I mean, it was so, so, it's such a diverse country, but I mean, people don't, um, they don't, there's not a lot of like tension over the differences in ethnicity or religion. It's very, very, very peaceful. Um, people just live their own ways and people just accept lots of other cu cultures in such a small um, space. And I mean, the biodiversity is outstanding. Borneo is, one of the top bio, um, like ecotourism places to visit in the world. That's where the orangutan um, lives. Um, that's where it's native to. Um, and orangutan, fun fact, is a B Malay word. It literally means person of the jungle, orangutan. Um, so fun fact. Um, if anybody, if any of you get a chance to visit, um, highly recommend. It's incredibly safe, incredibly peaceful. You'll meet some of the nicest people in the world. And there's just almost an infinite amount of things to do if you're interested in ecotourism and learning more about sustainability and um, the environment. You use that word peaceful so many times and that hit me the very first time you used it. I'm curious, do young people, are they on their screens? Are they on their computers, on their phones all the time like they are here? Or are they more, I mean, it sounds like they may not be the way we are. Uh, yeah, I think people definitely are on their screens all the time. Instagram, very, 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 very popular. Um, I mean, peaceful, I mean, it's a really uh, economically advanced country, I would say. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty modern, but um, I mean, yeah, students love Instagram. Like I have, I had students asking me for like, miss, miss, what's your IG? What's your IG? And I, I would actually post like stories on my Instagram that students could respond to in English and things like that. Um, and uh, they love their little like TikToks and the, the, the video making apps and stuff like that. They're totally addicted to that. I would say it's like the same, the same here. Um, I would even say Instagram is more popular there than it is here. I would follow my 14 year old students on Instagram and they had like 2,000 followers. They're a little like wannabe um, Insta influencers. It's so adorable. Um, but it's great now because um, even though I'm so far away, I use that to communicate with them. Um, if any of you have Instagram, you can see some of my experiences in uh, Malaysia. That's my username. So <laughs> you can look me up. So, uh, Laura, when you did your exchange um, in Peru, um, being that you've been a part of a Rotary Club in Minneapolis, um, how did it differ 
from exchange students that might have come into your club in Minneapolis or your mom's club in Minneapolis? Did you have um, multiple host families? Did you switch uh, switch homes? Um, how was what was the school like that you participated in, or or how was it different? In uh, in Peru. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I had two i had three different host families um the first one was in lima the second one was in iquitos which is that city in the amazon um and the third one was also in lima um the the first um, the first half of the year i was in a high school um i was the equivalent of a senior in a high school there um and um then there was like a summer break um, and I lived with my host family in Iquitos there. And uh, uh, then I came back to Lima and started taking some classes at a university. Um, but I think compared to students, from what it seems like who study in Italy, I went to school very, very little. Um, and I had a lot of free time, um, which I spent a lot just like hanging out with friends and Lima has a pretty good surfing scene, so I learned how to surf um, in Peru, which is really interesting. Um, I would say it was a lot more uh, laid back in terms of school, but the Rotary Club was um, pretty strict um, about how people saw it. There was, if you were in a Rotary Club, I think it was a sign of status um and so that was that could be uncomfortable sometimes um they were strict about how students looked and what they did and who saw them and there was like gossip and stuff in the rotary club which i didn't like um so i'd say the rotary clubs that i was involved with in minnesota were much more like friendly and relaxed a little bit um yeah does that answer your question yeah yeah i think there's different cultural um, ex extremes to that. I, I've heard that from other students that have come from, um, from South America, that their clubs are very much about status. And it's kind of the, the people who are in the Rotary Clubs tend to be the, the um, government or people that have influence. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's highly sought after. So that doesn't surprise me. And so how has your exchange um, transferred over into um, who you are today as far as your leadership and um, your goals, uh, the, the way that you think compared to maybe how you see your friends um, and, and your experience compared to someone who didn't go? Do you feel like it has enhanced your uh, view of the world? Oh, completely. I really think it fundamentally changed who I was as a person. Um, that sounds dramatic, but it's really true. Um, when you're 16, 17, 18, 19, those are really formative years. Um, you mean your brain's still growing and you're still, your brain's still like a sponge and you're open to so many opportunities. And I think I went at the right time just when I was 17. Uh, I turned 18 when I was there. Um, and it just made me feel much more connected to a larger community and international community. Um, and I saw, I mean, Peru is so different. I had never, I think I had been out of the country one time or maybe two times, once for a, like a wedding in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and then another time to Canada. But it was, Peru was like nothing I had ever seen before. Um, it was so different. I got there, my eyes were just so doughy and huge. Um, I remember the first whole like week being there. Um, and it just really motivated me to just keep learning about the world and keep traveling. I mean, I've moved around so much and I've loved every minute of it and every opportunity that has been uncomfortable has allowed me to grow. Um, and uh, I always promote it for other um, like other kids in, in high school or even in middle school, I'm like, oh, have you considered um, studying abroad or doing a youth exchange program? Um, 
my half sister um, is about three or four years younger than me. Um, when she was a junior in high school, I was, I must have been a sophomore in college at the time. And I was like, well, you're going to be graduating soon. You should seriously consider doing Rotary. It's a life changing experience. Um, and she did it. She went to um, Italy um, about, I think, three, three or four years ago now. Um, and it was an incredible experience for her. She learned to speak Italian. Um, and I think a lot of so many other exchange students have similar experiences. They just, they say it really shaped who they are as a person. Um, and not only having a sense of, a larger sense of community in like international, in the international world, having friends in other countries, but it really uh, makes you a confident person when you're um, a teenager and you're struggling with your identity and um, you have low self-esteem, maybe living in a place that you really have to be comfortable in who you are in order to get around um, is such a positive experience. And I really wish that every single 16 year old could do something like that. Fantastic. Well, um, why don't we uh, just, if there's anybody else who has one last question for Laura, why don't you go ahead and ask it? Otherwise we can wrap up and, um, and close down our meeting. Does anybody else have a question that they'd like to ask Laura? All right. Well, Laura, I want to thank you for being a, a guest on our e-club and um, sharing your story, not only just your youth exchange story, but um, so much more with um, the, uh, the Fulbright opportunities that you had as well. And we're very sorry that you got pulled away from all of that prematurely. And um, unfortunately, that uh, has happened more than we'd like to think. And hopefully in the next um, several months to a year, there'll be a lot more opportunities um, for you. So we wish you well on that and uh, are just really glad that you were able to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. So if anybody knows high school students who want to talk about this, um, they can, yeah, I, I put my Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, my email on the chat. So anyone, I'm, I'm an extreme extrovert. So I love talking to people, meeting new people. So feel Great. free to respond. All right. Well, with that, um, I think we'll call the meeting to an end. And uh, I don't have a rotary bell, but we'll ring the bell. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of um, the, uh, I was going to say the show, but because it feels like a show, but thanks for being a part of the club today. And next week, John will be back to uh, host. And so we are very, um, very looking forward to uh, the um, interview with Karen. And uh, so please come back and invite your friends. So thanks. And feel free to reach out to me through the website uh, as well. All right. Have a great day, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for listening.